In this presentation, we will take a look at the book of Amos and the one chapter in the book of Obadiah. As always, I would read the books before listening to the presentation so that you'll know the storyline and the details as I won't necessarily go over those, but only give commentary and insights concerning particular verses. So with that, let's take a look at an introduction to the book of Amos. Amos was a shepherd from Tekoa, a small village in the hill country of Judea, six miles south of Bethlehem. But his message was for the whole house of Israel and the nations of the world. It was not then a new message, and it has significance even today. Though Amos spoke of the judgments were about to descend on the nations surrounding Israel and on the two kingdoms of the house of Israel, his message is the same one God has given since the early history of the world. It is a simple yet profound message that carries a solemn warning. There is a way to come into God's favor and gain eternal life. That way is always open to the penitent and obedient. But to the impenitent, those who harden their hearts against the Lord, the way is shut. In the place of life there is death, in the place of joy there is sorrow. Punishment replaces blessings, judgments and destruction replaces protection and power. His ministry was about 750 BC, which would make him contemporary with Isaiah and Hosea. His preaching was mainly directed to Israel, the king to the north of Judah, which was prosperous, even wealthy. Greed, corruption, and vice reigned supreme in the so-called upper classes of society. The social lot of the poor classes was pitiful. Religion had little real vitality, and the dishonest insincerity and blindness of public officials made it possible for the strong to exploit the weak. Morals seemed all but forgotten. And to such a society walked the prophet of Tekoa and announced it with such vigor, clarity of thought, and authority that his message is still eagerly read and applied to modern situations. Well, if you take a look at today in our society, does not greed, corruption, and vice reign supreme, not in just upper class society, but almost in every class of society? Is not the lot of the poor exploited? And righteousness is forgotten, and justice does not seem to hold sway today. So as we study the book of Amos, think of today, and that the judgments that are pronounced upon the nations then because of these things will be the same judgments pronounced upon the world today, because we are going down a similar road. Let's take a look at a prologue, The Lord Roars from Zion. The first division dealing with the Lord's threats against the nations is masterly in its conception and execution. The prophet adopts a theme. The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. From Joel 3.16, which refers to the judgments of the latter days and applies it to God's judge, coming judgments on its eight nations, including his own country, Judah, but more especially Israel. In the words of Professor McFadden, the clear eyes of Amos saw the symptoms of rottenness and inevitable decay. And the words of his first recorded message are that Jehovah, the God of his easygoing people, would roar from his temple in Jerusalem like a lion just before he made his spring. The implications is that Jehovah will soon spring upon his people to tear them in pieces. And Amos's message we might describe as the gospel of the lion's roar. The prophet spins a web about his listeners and at the same time holds their interest by first pronouncing God's judgment upon successive nations outside of Israel. The nations are Damascus, which is the capital of Syria, Philistia, Phoenicia, Edom, Ammon, Moab, and Judah. Amos begins each of his denunciations with the words, Thus saith the Lord, For three transgressions, yea, for four, I will not reverse it. By three transgression is meant much sin. One sin is then specified out of the many to justify the coming judgment upon each nation. Amos's words thrill and delight his audience, particularly his pronouncements upon Judah, its hated rival kingdom. 
But suddenly, like a bolt from the blue, Amos turns upon his audience and the nations it represents. He stalks Israel as a lion does its prey. Israel, too, is as guilty of misconduct as the nations before mentioned. The wealthy mistreat the poor and humble. Prostitution is rampant, the people are wine-bibbers, prophets are disregarded, and young men are made to break their covenants. That's Amos 2, 6-12. But retribution is to come upon the guilty nation. God will strike, and the strong shall not be delivered. Amos 2, 13-16. As I said, today, do not the, will, the wealthy mistreat the poor and the humble. Isn't prostitution rampant in all of its forms? Is not alcohol and drug use just prolific amongst our nation? And prophets are disregarded amongst our nation and the world as a whole. So this message is very much to us. That's probably why Christ had it included in the Old Testament for us to study and to learn. Because of the judgments upon the nations surrounding Judah and Israel... And then Israel and Judah complicit in the same problems are the same problems today that will cause the judgments of God to come upon the earth. Well, if we take a look here circled in red, and this is my YouTube channel, and so I have a computer slide here showing this for those who are just listening in audio format only. I have the different nations that are given judgments again. Amos 1, 3, chapter 3 to chapter 2, verse 5, we have Damascus, Philistia, Phoenicia, Edom, Ammon, Moab, and Judah are the nations that Amos pronounces judgments coming from Jehovah. As you can see, forming a web around Israel or Samaria. And so all of these nations will face the judgments of God because of their wickedness. Amos 2, 5 through 16, coming judgments against Israel. And so, in Samaria. And so, the northern part up here of Samaria, and then the southern part down below where Judah is, they also will have the coming judgments against them because of wickedness. Amos 1 through 3 says, Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus, and for four, I want, will not turn away the punishment thereof. And in each one of these nations, he announces the judgments in that way. For three transgressions of Damascus, or three transgressions of Phoenicia, or three transgressions of Edom, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment. That doesn't mean, well, if they just would have stayed with three sins, they would have been fine, and the fourth one turned them over. This is good Hebrew poetry and symbolism. By three transgression is meant much sin. These nations had sinned greatly concerning its people. The number four is symbolic of totality, that is, the four corners of the earth, every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. The four winds from the four quarters of the earth, etc. So, in other words, what he's saying, thus for four sins, mean that the individual or nation has sinned completely. God's judgments are coming because they have become ripe in iniquity. So that's what that phrase means. For three transgressions of Damascus, and for four I will not turn away punishments. Meaning you have completely become ripe in iniquity. Therefore, my judgments cannot be turned away. The justice of God must come upon you. And so you can see the green Samaria. South of that would be Ju Judah, which obviously I didn't mark on there, but you can see that below. And so because they have completely become ripe in sin, the judgments of God are coming. So with that, let's take a look at Amos chapter 2 through 3, Jehovah's judgments upon the wicked. Let's take a look at these particular judgments upon each of these nations. Here the prophet Amos forecasts the Lord's judgments upon the Syrians, the Philistines, which is Philistia, Tyrrhenians, which would be Phoenicia, the Edomites, 
the Ammonites, and Moabites. All of these people were neighbors of the Israelites and in most cases had been enemies to the covenant people. Once those judgments had been pronounced, Amos outlined the judgments coming upon the kingdoms of Judah and Israel. His linking the two kingdoms of Israel with other nations suggests that Israel was no longer a peculiar people, but had become like the Gentile nations around them. See, that is a problem. Now, we have to talk about this word peculiar people. We use it in the church a lot, and it doesn't mean what we think it means. We keep, keep using that word. I don't think it means what you think it means. A famous movie quote. Peculiar does not mean to be a strange or weird person. People. Peculiar comes from the Hebrew word segula, which means to be a separated, it means to be a separated from something because it's a treasure, it's something valued, it's treasured property. It's property that's owned by someone and he treasures it, he shuts it up to himself. That's what peculiar means, it means uh, like jewels. That's why Malachi is going to use it in the jewels of the Lord. Okay, his jewels. Uh, a possession that someone possesses that they treasure up. Well, Israel and Judah have no longer become a people that Jehovah treasures. Because they have become just like everybody else. They become of wicked. They become diluted. And so they're no longer treasured by Jehovah. The reason given by Amos and his pronouncements of the judgments upon the various nations may seem puzzling at first. One could question whether one evil act, no matter how serious, normally brings the judgments of God upon a nation. Amos was inspired to use a poetic device. He selects, selected the act or trait of each nation that dramatically illustrates the extent of their wickedness. The one act mentioned is proof of how far that nation had sunk in iniquity. The following table summarizes the items mentioned and their significance. So even though he's only mentioning one sin that each one of these nations committed, he's using this as symbolic of may be something that is overall and reaching that has totally consumed them. And this, this is symbolic of their ripeness in iniquity. And so that's what he does in chapters 2 through 3. So in chart form, let's take a look at Amos chapters 2 through 3, each of these nations, and what's the one sin that's symbolic of being ripe in iniquity does Amos mention against each one? The nation, Damascus, uh, being the capital of the nation Syria. Thy threshing, they, they thresh Gilead with threshing instruments of iron. That's Amos 1.3. So that's the sin that he brings up of why judgments are now coming. Well, what is the significance of that? Gilead was part of the land on the east side of the river Jordan, inherited by the tribes of Gad, Reuben, and Manasseh. When the Syrians conquered it under Hazael, they eventually treated their captives with barbaric cruelty, crushing them under, thresh, under iron threshing sleds. Can you imagine being crushed by an iron threshing sled? And so that cruelty is just symbolic of how cruel and depraved that uh, the nation of Syria had become. G Gaza, the Philistines is the next nation. They carried away the whole captive of Edom, Amos 1.6. Well, what was that significant of? This passage seems to refer to the time when the Philistines raided Judah under the reign of Je Je Jehoram. That's in 2 Chronicles 21.16-17. They sold all their captives to their arch enemy of Israel, the Edomites. And so coming in, conquering them, and then selling them as slaves, captivating them, and profiting. Human trafficking is what we're saying here. So Tyrus or Tyre, so the nation of Phoenicia, they delivered up the Israelites captive to Edom, Amos 1.9. 
Like Gaza, Phoenicia also sold Israelite captives, although it may be that Phoenicians bought the captives from other enemies of Israel, such as Syria, and then sold them to Edom, since there is no record of Tyre capturing Israelites directly. So they were also involved in human trafficking and selling people for money, slavery, all of that. Do we have that today? Well, yes, we do. This will be one of the judgments God will pronounce upon this world for why he will bring punishment and destruction upon the earth uh, to the wicked. Edom, or Edomia, the nation of Edom, pursued his brother with the sword and, and kept his great wrath. That's Amos 1.11. Well, that signified the Edomites were the descendants of Esau, whose name was also Edom. Thus, they were closely related peoples, brothers to Israel, but showed only bitter hatred and hostility. The Edomites were some of Israel's most determined enemies. And so because of their wrath, because of their hatred, their animosity, uh, going to war, seeking to destroy them, that is why judgments will come upon this nation and these nations. Well, do we have hatred, animosity, anger towards people today? Ammon or the Ammonites. Rabbah was the capital of Ammon. They ripped up women with child of Gilead, Amos 1.13. Meaning, the incident mentioned here is not recorded in the Old Testament, but the Ammonites were a fierce desert people who often conquered parts of Israel. To kill pregnant women shows a particularly brutal nature. So the one sin that stood out that represents their ripened iniquity is killing the unborn children inside of women. Hello? I don't know how... Amos and Jehovah could warn us more. What do you think the whole abortion industry is? They rip up the women with children of Gilead. The destruction it does to women and the obvious destruction it does to the unborn child. You don't, you think we're going to escape judgments of God because of this religious sacrament that is practiced in this world called abortion on the altars and doctor's offices so that women won't be held responsible so they can not lose their figures so they won't lose their job because they can't be inconvenienced or whatever hundred thousands of reasons we all agree that the life of the mother, incest, and rape, yeah, but that is the small little percentage. The wholesale abortion because of inconvenience and because of Satan's influence upon mankind. Like I said, to some, it is a religion. This is their sacrament to their God. The Moabites, the nation of the Moabites, says the king of Moab burned the bones of the kings of Edom, Amos 2.1. What does that mean? Kyle and Dilich make the following note. The burning of the bones of the king of Edom is not burning while he was still alive, but the burning of the corpses into lime. That is, so completely that the bones turned into powder like lime. No record has been preserved of this event in the historical books of the Old Testament, but it is no doubt connected with the war referring to in 2 Kings 3, which Jer Joram of Israel and Jehoshaphat of Judah waged against the Moabites in company with the king of Edom, so that the Jewish tradition found in Jerome that after this war, the Moabites dug up the bones of the kings of Edom from the grave and heaped insults upon them by burning them to ashes is apparently not without foundation. So again, just utter destruction and contempt and hatred of your enemies. And, and just seeking destruction in the most horrific ways. Well, those were the nations 
that were the Gentile nations, the sins that they had committed had become ripe in iniquity. Amos said, now Israel and Judah has participated in their own. Let's take a look at what their sins were that was now going to cause their destruction. The Assyrians destroying Israel and later the Babylonians destroying the kingdom of Judah. Amos chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, the punishments of Judah and Israel. The reasons for the punishment of Judah and Israel differ from those from the punishments of the Gentile nations. No acts are mentioned except for the forsaking of the Lord and turning to wickedness. Israel had been given the law of God, therefore more was expected of them. Panting after the dust of the earth upon the head of the poor, that's verse 7, this is in chapter 2, refers to the people being generally oppress, oppressors of the poor, showing them neither justice nor mercy. The idea is that the people longed to see the poor in such a state of misery that they threw dust on their heads, a sign of mourning. Well, t tell me we don't see that today in our, in, in our world, in our society those who just have contempt for the poor. Verses 11 and 12 refer to the Nazarites who were instituted by the Lord to show the spiritual nature of his religion. See Numbers 6, 2-21. Amos condemned Israel for polluting the Nazarites by giving them wine to drink. That was one of the vows they made, to not drink any strong drink, any alcohol. He also chastised them for commanding the prophets not to prophesy. Apparently, Israel would have liked to set these servants of the Lord aside so they could live every man according to his own way and feel comfortable in doing so. And so the sins of Israel and Judah, are that they're causing people to break their vows, their commandments, their covenants. That's what he's trying to point out. And to put and get rid of the prophets and to live after their own law, not the law of God. Well, do we see that today? Judgment will come upon in our day then, because we see similar things going on. Gospel principle. Openly rebelling against God leads to destruction of our souls and brings the judgments of God. They came. The whole point of this and the reason why Jehovah has us study this and wants this in the Old Testament and wants us to learn it is because he said, look, here's the judgments that came upon these nations in Judah and Israel. We have the history. The punishments came. The nations came and conquered them and took them captive and oppressed them and destroyed their nations. What makes you think Jehovah will not do it again to the wicked today? If he did it then, he will do it today. If he said he'd do it then, and he's warning us today, then he will do it today too. The only way out is through righteousness and covenants. Keeping the laws of God in our hearts. Amos chapter 3 verses 1 through 2. We see an eternal law principle put into practice here. In this day of scientific method and observation, we are far too prone to assume that whereas law and order reign in the physical domain, it is questionable that they do so in the realm of spiritual values. It is to the eternal honor of Amos that he perceived law reigning as inextricably in the realm of the spirit as it does in the physical world. Law is law, whether it's for a physical world or a spiritual law. They both operate. Amos applied his observation with characteristic vigor and clarity to the position of Israel before the Lord. Amos 3 verses 1 through 2 says, Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up out of the land of Egypt, saying, Ye only have I known all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will visit upon you all your iniquities. I have blessed you. You have not kept the law. Hmm. Law, observation, cause and effect. Okay. You have not kept it. There's the cause. The effect is your iniquities. You will now be punished. Destruction is coming. So law, the cause of law and of cause and effect apply to the physical world and the spiritual realm. 
The two poetic lines above form one of the grandest passages in all of Scripture. In the Hebrew Scripture, to know often signifies to care for, both with the understanding and the heart. Thus Amos pointed out the unique role God had assigned to Israel in the world. Amos understood that Israel was the chosen people of God in the sense that it was a covenant people. But we can easily imagine Amos saying, Special privileges implies corresponding responsibility, O Israel, and you have not measured up. Famous to us would be then, there is a law irrevocably decreed in heaven before the foundations of this world, upon which all blessings are predicated. When we obtain any blessings from God is by obedience to that law in which upon it is predicated. That applies to physical laws and to spiritual laws. There is a cause and effect. Israel was chosen, took upon them the covenant relationship with Jehovah. The effect would have been blessings and eternal life and exaltation. The breaking of such would be the effect, disobedience, destruction, and captivity and oppression. Okay, cause and effect, whether spiritual or physical, still applies. As Professor McFadden has written, they, Israel, believed in their election without understanding the reasons for it. They failed to realize that election to privilege is always election to duty and responsibility. The same is true today in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. When we enter into a covenant relationship through baptism and then later in the temple and at the sacrament table each Sunday, we need to realize that duty and responsibility comes with that. Amos then proceeded to clinch by a series of homely illustrations from the physical world his point that law reigns also in the realm of spirit. Okay, he's already pointed out, look, you've spiritually been chosen, you had responsibility because you broke that spiritual responsibility, you will reap punishment. Just like if you break the law of gravity, you reap punishments. You jump off a building, you will fall and hit the ground. There's punishment. Now he's going to cement this more. Look what he does. Amos 3, 3-6 three through six says, Will two walk together except they have agreed? Will a lion roar in the forest when he hath no prey? Well, no, that, that doesn't make sense. I don't think so. Will a lo young lion give forth his voice out of his den if he has taken nothing? Well, well, no. Will a bird fall in a snare upon the earth where there is no lure for it? Uh, n no. Will a snare spring up from the ground and have taken nothing at all? Shall the horn be blown in a city and the people not tremble? The horn meaning the trumpet that was the warning voice of the army coming? Well, well, no, that, that, that was the sign to tremble. Shall evil befall a city and the Lord hath not known it? The JST changes no to not know it. Well, no. The answer to each of these questions is no. The great law of cause and effect is apparent in the world of material things. Okay, Just like if you blow the warning horn that an army is coming, the people will tremble. There's a cause and effect. Okay, uh, Looking at the others. Will two walk together except they have agreed? Well, no, you can't be walking together and be compatible unless you're in agreement with each other. Okay, cause and effect. There is little or nothing we know of that is isolated or haphazard. For every phenomenon, there is a cause and a rational explanation. 
As it is in the physical world, so in the world of spiritual values. A nation sows, so shall it reap. Therefore, as Amos said Amos to Israel, I will visit upon you all your iniquities. Just like there is a cause and effect, there is a law relation of a cause and effect in the physical world, so there is in the spiritual world. You sow wickedness, you reap wickedness. You sow unrighteousness, you get the fruits of righteousness. The fruit of your iniquity, which is destruction, sorrow, grief, oppression, captivity. Gospel principle. God is a God of law and order. What we sow, we shall also reap. You cannot sow unrighteous behavior and reap joy, peace, happiness, or in other words, fruits of the Spirit. That is incompatible, just as it is incompatible in the physical world. Well, Amos 3, 7 through 8, the Lord reveals his counsel to his servants, the prophets. There is another law in effect. Amos points out to Israel that his message to the nation, too, has a cause. He appears because the Lord has confided in him and has revealed to his servant the coming doom of Israel. Prophets are the men unto whom God gives counsel and revelation, and woe to the nation that heeds not what they say. That is how God works. He will always send his servants, the prophets, to reveal what is to come. Just like 2 Nephi 27, 14 says, Wherefore the Lord God proceeds to bring forth the words of the book, and in the mouth of his many witnesses as seemeth him good he will establish, and woe be unto him that rejecteth the word of God. Amos 3, 7. Surely the Lord God will do nothing but reveal his secrets unto the servants, his prophets. And woe unto him that rejecteth the word of God through his prophets. There's a cause and effect relationship. Reject the words of the prophets and you will reap sorrow and captivity. That is what he's trying to say here. I have come to warn you. You have been wicked. There's a cause. The effect now is me coming and to warn you that destruction is imminent unless you repent. So today we have them. It will be to our own peril if we do not heed them. You would be an idiot not to. Amos 3, 7, as I said, For the Lord will do nothing until he revealeth, until was added by Joseph Smith, his counsel and his servants, the prophets. The lion hath roared. Who will not fear? Duh! The Lord hath spoken. Who can but prophesy? In other words, this is a no-brainer, as we would say in today's vernacular. Prophecy comes by direct revelation. God has knowledge of all his children and their doings and justly warns and threatens with his judgments. The fact that the prophets prophesy correctly is an indication that they are in communion with God and that they do indeed walk together. What was it, two or three years ago? President Nelson warned us. And told us, as a prophet, you better have the spirit if you're going to survive spiritually and navigate these troubled times. Boy, how true has that been since he has said that? It has correctly come to pass. He prophesied correctly. Did we heed it? Are we heeding it? Are we using the Holy Ghost as our personal guide. Notice he did not say, listen to everything I say and don't do anything until I as the prophet in the first presence tell you to do something in the church. No, that's not his job. His job is to direct the affairs of the church, not your life personally. 
If that was his job, then what would I need the Holy Ghost for if I was just to follow the prophet and every little thing I was to do? No. I am to follow the Spirit, the Holy Ghost, through personal revelation. That is the key to getting through and not being deceived in the last days. You better learn how to get the Holy Ghost and how to use it, or you will not navigate these troubled times. That I can promise. President N. Eldon Tanner said, there are many scriptures which assure us that God is as interested in us today as he has been in all his children from the beginning. And thus we believe in continuous revelation from God through his prophets to guide us in these latter days. The prophet Amos said, surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants the prophets. And he does that to direct his church. And now for my life individually, because the prophet is not responsible for everything I do, and for my life individually, he gives me the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost trumps everything. Everything. He is a member of the Godhead. He is a God. I follow all and every prompting of the Holy Ghost in my life. He trumps everything. Everything. Gospel principle. God will always do his work through prophets whom he counsels. And personally in our lives, I would add, through the Holy Ghost. Amos 4, chapters 1 through 3. Women determine the temper and quality of a civilization. No, that is not taking responsibility away from men. They're not responsible for moral behavior and that kind of thing. But there is a special role given to women that help temper and bring about the level of quality of civilization as a part of their unique gift. Amos points it out. Amos must have been a man of suburb cur- sub- superb courage, and daring. He boldly continued that part of his address dealing with the grounds for God's coming judgments by giving a scathing rebuke to women in high places. Many of our English translations are too elegant to reveal effectually Amos' contempt for the women of Israel who were helping to make its social life cruel and rotten, and its religion a gregor... a gor- Gorgracious? Gorgeous sham. Hmm. What he actually said was, so here is Amos chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Uh, MCV, you've heard of uh, King James Version, KJV. MCV is Mike Clough Version. Here, here's a better translation, giving what he's trying to say. Isn't that interesting? The women of Israel who were helping to make society cruel and rotten. Which means they added to it. We already know that men do that. And the rule and the history has proven that. What he's trying to show is that both genders can add to that. And when women do, then we've really got some problems on our hands. Amos 4, 1 through 3. Hear this word, ye haughty cows of Bashan. That was referring to the fertile lands up north. So he calls them haughty cows. This is not flattering. Who are on the Mount of Samaria, that's the capital of northern Israel. Ye women oppress the poor, crush the destitute. Who say to their husbands, bring, let us drink. The Lord Jehovah has sworn by his holiness. Behold, days come upon you that he will carry you away with hooks and the remnant of you with fish hooks. What was it that they were demanding so much of their husbands? This bring and let us drink. We're going to see later what was going on and some of the detail. But the wine that they wanted and that was made by the poor and we've already seen that the poor were treated very poorly 
in society at this time. That they demanded that they continually had wine to drink and alcohol and demanded that their husbands bring it, even at the expense of oppressing the poor. No, we must have our luxuries. We must have our nice cars, our homes, our clothing, our earrings. You must provide me with nice stuff. And you shall go out of the breaches, every one straight before her. So he warns. Because of the demands the women were now putting upon their husbands. We've already seen that the king and the priest and the stuff, they've already become corrupt. The leadership, the male leadership, all become corrupt. And now the women are of the upper class demanding the luxuries at the expense of oppression of other people. And he says, your days are coming that you will now be oppressed. You'll be carried away with hooks and with fish hooks. See, that's literally going to take place when the Assyrians come to northern Israel and take them away so that the captives would not leave and flee. They would put these hooks in their jaw, a fish hook, a big fish hook, and tie ropes to them, and that way they're all tied together. And when you pulled, you would follow with that hook. In, in your jaw and all the slaves and all the captives together. Yeah, and that's how they would lead them along. And so they wouldn't escape. And you shall be cast into Hamon. Ha, I'm sorry, Harmon. That means a foreign land. And so they were. They were taken captive to Assyria. Saith the Lord. Amos compares the woman of Samaria with the fat and well-fed cows roaming on pastures to the east of the Sea of Galilee. These rich, voluptuous, and violent women were qualified partners for their lords whom Amos has already denounced, who store up violence and robbery in their palaces. That's in Amos 3.10. See, the men have already done this, and now their wives are now complicit in this. The ones who should be who should be begging and trying to subdue their husband. Please, don't be so oppressed. They're now complicit in it. The sin of these sleek women consisted in their tyrannical oppression of the poor people by requesting their husbands to procure them wine brought with money squeezed from their victims. It was the poor that had to produce it. And regardless of the state of the poor and their condition, these women demanded they continually had their luxuries. And we're going to see more clearly, not just wine, but this was symbolic of luxury. The demand at the expense of others that I have my luxuries. This is proof that President Nelson was right when he said the following general conference. From the drawing of time, women have been blessed with a unique moral compass, the ability to distinguish right from wrong. This gift is enhanced in those who make and keep covenants, and it diminishes in those who willfully ignore the commandments of God. Remember, Amos is prophesying to members of the church in Israel who have become wicked. So these are people who had made covenants. They should have known better, and they did know better. They just didn't care and wanted the things and luxuries of the world. I hasten to add that I dare not absolve men in any way from God's requirements, for it's them also to distinguish between right and wrong. But, my dear sisters, your ability to discern truth from error, to be society's guardians of morality, is crucial in these latter days as it was in Amos's day. It broke down, and look what it turned to. Back to President Nelson. And we depend on you to teach others to do likewise. Let me be very clear about this. If the world loses the moral rectitude of its women, the world will never recover. Israel, Amos just told them, you have lost the moral rectitude of your women. And it never recovered. It was conquered by Assyria, by cruel Assyrians, with cruelty and oppression that you do not want to know. Just study how cruel the Assyrian army was to their captors. Amos chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, and the next ones I'm going to do in chapter 6, are 
proof that President Nelson is telling the truth. We lose the moral rectitude of women, then it is over. It's finished. Brethren, hearken to the moral rectitude that is just seems to be naturally born into your wives and your daughters. Listen, follow. It will save us. We Latter-day Saints are not of the world. We are coming in Israel. We are called to prepare our people for the second coming of the Lord. The rect moral rectitude of the women in Amos's day fell. And they never recovered from it. They never recovered. And so will this world. John E. McFadden, scholar, wrote, a country is largely what it women make of it. If they are cruel or careless or unwomanly, the country is on the road to ruin. But these cattle on the hills of Samaria, of whom Amos flings his words of scorn, are worse than the cattle on the hills of Bashan. For they have done what no animal could do. They have made coarse pleasure and deliberate end of life. They are fit partners for the Lord's already denounced. Drink, as we have seen, was one of the national perils of the day. And no sight can be uglier than a drunken woman. Intemperance and cruelty went together then, as they do so often still. When women, who should be pitiful, sink sink to such depths of shame and heartlessness, it must be made plain that God will soon appear to mete out to them what they had meted to the poor. When a woman of society become just as debauched and immoral and degraded as the men who naturally struggle with this and have to fight it all the time, women seem to have an inborn innate sense of not and of being helping to temper, temper the male gender. Yeah, male gender, I said it. There really is a male gender. And to temper that and to help that when they now sink to the depths then judgment is coming. And so we see today the feminist movement in the United States and the world, their whole goal is to sink to the depths of the male gender of depravity. We can have illicit sex like them. We can kill like them. They kill in wars. We'll just kill our babies. We can be rough like them. We, we, we can be coarse like them. We can be profane like them. That's, that's what feminism is about. And this is where it leads to. Like so many fish pulled out of their element with fish hooks, these women, with all their luxury, would be taken in hand by Israel enemies. They would be insulted, abused, and cast around like old rags and cast into a foreign land. In sorrow and shame, they would realize that repentance came too late. Thus, in the same way that fish are caught with hooks and pulled from the pond, these women and their children would soon become ensnared by Israel's enemies and violently torn from their affluency and debauchery. We can either repent on our own and receive the blessings of God and become humble, or God will humble us. He will take all away from us that we have. So we can either choose to be humble and get blessed, or we can have all taken away and become humble and oppressed. It is up to us. Gospel principle. Women, too, have a leading role to play in the salvation of this world. And do not let Satan convince you otherwise that you have a significant role. And do not let him convince you or distort or deceive you of what that role is. Well, how bad was their sin? How bad was this really between the women in Amos? And what was going on between the men and women? 
Let's take a look. This is found in chapter 6. I know we're jumping ahead, but these two go together. Chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, tell us, okay, how bad was it really? Well, Amos tells us. Amos turns his invective on the careless and reckless rich of Israel, on those who are at ease, on the self-satisfied and the arrogant. Well, that describes today. We're at ease. We have... I'm not talking about the millionaires. We're talking anybody that lives in the United States. We are so wealthy compared to anybody else in the world, and have so much ease. In short, on those who, having plenty, take no thought of the sad social religious state of their country, these persons are absolutely indifferent to the threatened ruin of their people. The prophet indicates that exile is to be their portion, that the nation is to be destroyed because its inhabitants pervert truth and righteousness and trust in their own strength. That is an exact description of today. That's why we've got to study this in the Old Testament, because that's us in society as a whole. Well, let's take a look, starting with verse 1 read these verses. I'm going to go through them. Well, I'll go through them. Actually, I'm going to read the verses and give commentary on each one on what's going on. Woe to them that are at ease in Zion and trust in the mountain of Samaria, which are named chief of the nations to whom the house of Israel came. At ease meaning careless, arrogant pride, a false sense of security. Woe to them that trust in their riches, not because we're wealthy and things are going well. And at this time in their history, Israel's very wealthy. The economy is going very well. Woe unto them that find security in this. Trust in the mountains is a Samaria phrase, meaning they trust in their wealth, their position, themselves. See, remember Nephi? I think it's 2 Nephi 28. Woe unto them that are at ease in Zion. This is the exact same thing meaning that are careless, arrogant, prideful. So we know that arrogance and pride, a false sense of security in material things are what's going on in the church and in society. I put the church in together because that's the society we're talking about. Israel, the church members. 6.2. Pass ye into Kalne, and see, and from thence go ye to Mat, the great. Then go down to God of the Philistines, Be they better than these kingdoms, or their borders greater than your borders? Isaiah is saying, he invited them to visit other places of destruction that the Assyrians have have, uh, destroyed. Kalne and Mesopotamia, Hamad and Syria, and Gath and Philistia. And observe what happened to these people there. Go and see what Assyria has done to them. Were the Israelites any better than they? See, they would have said, yes, we are. We're the covenant people. That's how arrogant they were. In their self-righteousness, they thought they were keeping the law of Moses. Oh, they kept the outward forms of it, but in their hearts they weren't. They would go to church and partake of the sacrament, but it didn't mean anything. It didn't change them any. They had been punished, and so would Israel. If he didn't spare them because of their wickedness, what makes you think he's going to spare you, Israel? That's what Amos is saying to them. You see what's going on in their society and their wickedness and the level of it? Verse 3, Ye that put away the evil day and cause the seed of violence to come near, meaning they refuse to think of the coming tribulation. Oh, things aren't that bad. Things are okay. We've got plenty of time to repent. It's okay. It's not that da They enthroned violence in their midst. They condoned violence. They accepted violence. They participated in violence. They didn't get rid of it. Does that sound familiar? They used violence to probably get means and and, 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 and to gain wealth and position. And so we're getting to see what's going on. This is how bad their sins were. Now remember, this is happening amongst all of society. 
The men and the women are participating. Usually these things I've talked about so far are usually just men. And we know that men and that other nations and kings, they've all done these kinds of things. And that the natural man and the pride of man has come out. But what we're saying is women are now participating and going along and lusting in all of this too. Chapter 6, verse 4. They that lie upon beds of ivory and stretch themselves upon their couches and eat the lambs out of the flocks and the calves out of the midst of the stall. I don't know if you can, can't you just picture that when you can picture the luxury and the ease and their arrogance and their pride as they have their beds of ivory, they stretch themselves out, they have lavish meals. No shepherd would eat their own flocks. They were used for wool and other things. Oh, they don't care about the flocks. We just want the food, the luxuries, and the calves. Out of the midst of the stall, the best, the ones taking care of the best. Reclining at meals was a custom introduced from the Far East. The, not the notables, the notables, meaning the nobles, now stress themselves out in looseness. Luxury and idleness are implied. They have luxury, and they have idle time to do idle things. God, does that sound familiar? Eat the lambs, etc. To a fugal shepherd, the feeding up the beast for food seems shameful and extravagant. Seldom the nomads eat other flesh than the meat of their sacrifices. But it, it, but it be some beast that will not thrive or is likely to die in their hands. They would eat those. But now they go out of the best and just take the flocks and eat. They're that luxurious. They have that much idle time. They have that much wealth. And so they participate in idle things. And things that breed arrogance and pride. Chapter 6, verse 5. They chant to the sound of the viol and vent to themselves music, instruments of music like David, meaning the musicians were lazy triflers. So they had their music. They had all the music and stuff, and they could just sit and relax and let the poor and the other underclass and just take, and they labored and stuff, and you had the, you had the upper nobility and upper rich that are just Idle, the idle wealthy that produce nothing. Chapter 6, verse 6. That drink wine and bowls and anoint themselves with the chief ointments, but they are not grievous for the affliction of Joseph. Meaning, the goblet is not enough. They must have bowls to drink out of. Bowls of costly material, such as were generally used in divine service. The threatened ruin of the nation did not move these unpatriotic festers to dispense with costly banquets. Okay, not just a little cup or a goblet. They had to have these fine porcelain bowls. Whether porcelain, I don't know, but that brings an image to mind. And these costly banquets. As men in trouble... They're usually ready to do. Chapter 6, verse 7. Now catch this one. All of this and this too. Therefore now shall they go captive. With the first that go captive. Here's who will go captive first. And the banquet of them that stretch themselves shall be moved. Now, let me retranslate that to a more little translation. As I'm saying, the King James Version is very genteel here and very kind. Here is what that really means. A better translation giving a clearer meaning of the sin they were committing would be this. Therefore now shall they be first go captive, those who were unrestrained in rivalry, meaning sexual orgies. In Hebrew, it's called Merzeach. That's what Israel was doing. That's what members of the church were doing. That's what was going up with the society because of the wealth and the richness and the idleness and the arrogance and the pride. They were having these large banquets 
that were also full of sexual orgies. Do you see why Jehovah is just a little ticked off? And he warns, tells Amos to warn them, I will now destroy you. Think of all of our sexual impurities that our society commits because of our ease and our arrogance and our luxury. One click on the internet and you can see some of the most vile stuff. Chapter 6, verse 8. The Lord God hath sworn by himself, saith the Lord God of hosts, I abhor the excellency, meaning the pride, of Jacob, and hate his palaces. Therefore will I deliver up the city with all that is therein. That one doesn't need any explanation. Verse 9, And it shall come to pass, if there remain ten in one house, that they shall die. The city is besieged, and if there is a house in which the pestilence has left ten alive, their turn shall come. That's what that means. Don't worry, it'll come upon you too. Verse 10, And a man's uncle shall take him up, and he that burneth him, to bring him out of the bones out of the house, and shall say unto him, that is by the sides of the house, Is there yet any with thee? And he shall say, No. Then shall he say, Hold thy tongue, for we may not make mention of the name of the Lord. Clarification. It was the duty of the next of kin to see to the disposal of the body, and that while interment was the almost universal rule, cremation might be resorted to in special circumstances. The plague-stricken man in the inner rooms of the house must not defile the Lord's name by uttering it in the immediate presence of death, showing how bad things would get. They would turn to cremation. And you're not to utter the Lord's name in the presence of death. Verse 10 is how bad. Hold thy tongue. Do not make mention of the Lord's name. There is death surrounding us here. It would surround them. All because of their corruptive immorality. Amongst men and women. And you see a lot of this is directed to the upper class but see, that drives the lower class to now envy the upper class and present hatred because of the way they're being treated. And so you get hatred and envy and pride and arrogance going both directions. 6.11 For behold, the Lord commandeth, and he will smite the great house with breaches and the little house with clefts, meaning from the greatest to the least will be afflicted by destruction. And so it is when the Assyrians come. They will afflict them all. Verse 12. Shall horses run upon the rocks? Will one plow with there with oxen? For ye have turned judgment into gall, and the fruit of righteousness into hemlock. Meaning, shall horses run off the cliff? Will a plow, will a man plow the sea with oxen? That's another way you could translate that. No. But in moral and religious matters, they will do things as absurd as these. You have turned judgment into gall, the fruit of righteousness into hemlock. You don't run a horse off a cliff. You don't plow with the sea with an oxen. But what they're doing religiously and morally is more absurd than that. Verse 13. Ye which rejoice in the thing of naught, which say, have we not taken to us horns by our own strength? Ye which do rejoice in Lodabar, meaning not, which say, Have we not taken for us Karnaim horns by our own strength? Israel had been reduced to a very low ebb in the time of Jehoaz by the repeated and successful assaults of the Syrians. With the advent of Joash, all this was altered. He recovered ten cities, which Hazael had taken and gained three victories. Jeroboam II carried these successes still further. He restored the border of Israel from the entering into Hamat, unto the sea of the Iaba, and appears to have been uniformly victorious. And so they rejoiced in 
that, yeah, for a time they had strength. They had rejoiced in taking Lodabar and Karnaim, the horns of their strength. They had conquered certain towns, and that led to their arrogance and their pride that nothing could happen to them. Verse 14, But behold, I will raise up against you a nation, O house of Israel, saith the Lord God of hosts, and they will afflict you from the entering into Hermot unto the river of the wilderness. Thus Israel's destruction was made sure by her own choice. Horses cannot run on rocks without slipping, nor can man plow rocks in order to plant. That was verse 12 we read. By the same token, rebellious Israel could not expect to prosper in her evil state. Verse 13 is an indictment against Israel, who rejoice in casting off the Lord's power and feeling sufficient in and of herself. See, that's what I just read of about Lodbar and the other place, that they had gained some victories and done some things, and so they're casting off the Lord. Look, look how powerful we are without him. But this was all to end with the invasion by the Assyrians. Within 30 years, what Amos had predicted was fulfilled. That's all it took, 30 years after this prophecy. And Israel is destroyed. Brendan Sisters, this last general conference, the first talk from the senior apostle, President Russell M. Nelson of the First Presidency, the words out of his mouth of his first talk was for us to stop abusing people physically, emotionally, mentally, sexually. That's the first message out of his mouth? I think Amos is coming to warn us. Amos 4, verses 4 through 13, going back now to chapter 4. How did the Lord regard Israel's spiritual condition? The sacrifices of Israel had degenerated into heartless ritual. It did no good to go to religious centers, to Bethel or Gilgal, and offer sacrifice in a sinful state. The outward sacrifices should have symbolized repentance and inward change. But outward sacrifices without inward change is a mockery, and God will not be mocked. They did all the outward things, but they did not change inwardly. Like I told you, they went to sacrament meeting, probably paid their tithes, probably even quote active in the gospel. Sidney B. Sperry, a great Old Testament scholar, wrote, Israel was meticulous in its performances of the outward requirements of its religion, but the inner and less tangible requirements, love, mercy, justice, and humility, either were not understood or were disregarded. I maintain that it's the latter. They were disregarded. They were taught. In an endeavor to bring his people to their senses, the Lord to their senses, the Lord said Amos had sent upon them seven natural calamities. <clears throat> Let me read that better. To bring his people to their senses, the Lord said Amos had sent upon them seven natural calamities. So here's what would come to them. Cleanness of teeth, that means hunger. There's no food in your teeth. There's no, there's no nothing in your teeth. So they're, they're going to have hunger, drought, blasting and mildew, insect pestilence, pest, pestilence, death by the sword, and burning were brought in succession, but all to no avail. Amos's heart was bleeding over the sinful state of Israel. He could do nothing but warn the nation of the final blow which God would send, and for which the people must prepare themselves. That's Amos 4, 12, 13. It was no pleasure for him to pronounce judgment upon his brethren. But judgment must come, brothers and sisters, and so it will come to our nation, our society, our communities, our families, us, unless we heed the promptings of the Holy Ghost and the teachings of the God through his prophets and the Spirit and keep our covenants. The God of hosts, the Amos 4.13, is the Lord Jesus Christ, the creator of heaven of earth. In these, when he refers to that. The gospel principle, outward religious ritual only, will never have the power to save anyone. Programs in this church, brothers and sisters, are only to help us to come unto Christ. 
If we run programs for the sake of running programs, we are doing no better than ancient Israel. There is not one program that has the power to save anybody. I don't care how many times you go to the temple. It will not save you. It's whether the temple gets in your heart and the covenants and the ordinances and turns you to Christ and keeps you in the stead of Christ and his covenants and you will never waver. Amos 5, 1 through 3, Amos' is lament. Amos now laments, the virgin of Israel has fallen. She shall no more rise. She is cast down upon her land. There is none to raise her up. For thus saith the Lord God, the city that went forth a thousand shall have a hundred left. And that which went forth a hundred shall have ten left of the house of Israel. You can feel his lament, can't you? Now I underline that for you to notice something. Notice in verse 3 that a tithe was paid. Amos 4.4 4 warned them about their lack in pain. A city that had a thousand, there's now a hundred left. Well, that's a tenth. A city that had a hundred, there's now ten left. One way or another, brothers and sisters, you and I will pay tithing. I can either do it voluntarily and be blessed with God's spirit and salvation and, and, and eternal life, or God will exact a tithe out of me. He exacted it out of them. That is something to be noticed. Amos 5, 4 through 27, hate evil and love the good. After this lament, Amos paradoxically proceeds to exhort his listeners to change their ways. Amos 5, 4 through 7, seek ye me and live, but seek not Bethel. Seek the Lord and live, lest, lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph, and it devour and there be none to quench it in Bethel. Ye who turn justice to wormwood and cast righteousness to the ground. A nation in the, pos in the process of moral decay can still repent and find God if it will. That's what he's trying to say here. And here is the paradox of prophecy. When God makes threats against his people, they are conditional. When God threatens, he is promising. When he comes near in any way, it is for our salvation. God is not obligated to fulfill his threats, but he is obligated to fulfill his promises. So if God warns and says, look, this is what coming, and the, we call it threats because it appears as a threat, then we can still repent. But if he comes and says, now I'm sorry, this will happen, and he promises, then we're in trouble. Amos 5, 8 through 15. Amos 5, 8 through 9 talks about seek and worship the creator, not the creation. Him who will bring justice and strength to those spoiled by unjust practices. Amos 5, 10. Much of the governmental business was done at the gate of the city. Thus society hated those who expected righteousness in government. Verses five, chapter 5, verse 11. Because the unjust have burdened the poor with poverty, the rich will not live in the houses they build, nor eat of the food they have planted, which came to pass after the Syrian invasion of Israel. Chapter 5, verse 12. Israel was not hiding their sins from Jehovah. He knew of their unrighteous behavior in the social conditions of the people and government. Chapter 5, verse 13 means, What is the use of talking? Thus the counsel to stay silent to those who care for the future. We see Savior do this before the high priest Caiaphas. Remember, Caiaphas asked him questions and he would not say a word. There was no, there was no use in talking to him. And so there are times to stay silent. That's what he's talking about in verse 13. Chapter 5, verses 14 through 15, notice Amos' emphasis on the word live. He uses the word here in much the same sense as the Syriac version of the New Testament uses the word life. Life stands equally for salvation, and to be saved is to live. Amos had a passion for justice. Goodness to Amos had a strong social color. He wanted justice in society and fair play between man and man. 
And that was not happening. As we want that today. Gospel principle. Only through doing the will of God can we come unto the throne of grace and receive salvation. Chapter 5, verses 16 through 20. The terrors of the day of the Lord. The prophet paints a doleful picture of the lamentation that will take place in Israel when the Lord passes in the midst of her. This is followed by a cry of woe upon those that desire the day of the Lord. We learn in the chapter on Joel the true meaning of this expression as it has reference to the latter days when the Lord will come in glory to manifest himself in the destruction of the enemies of the righteous and to exalt those who have loved him. That's what the day of the Lord means. The coming of the destruction of the wicked. The people of Israel, though they loved the Lord, and many of them yearned for the coming of the day of exaltation. Upon these hypocrites, Amos pronounced a woe. Even if the Lord were to come in their day, which he would not, it would be a day of calamity and darkness, not light. It would be as if a man did flee from a lion and a bear met him and went into the house and leaned his hand on the wall and a serpent bit him. Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light? So that's from Amos chapter 5. Okay, Seeking the day of the Lord when you're not ready for it and you're not repentant is like fleeing from a lion and you meet a bear. Well, that went well. Or leaning against a wall and a serpent is, is there on the wall and bites you. Even very dark and no brightness in it. Amos 5, 19 through 20. Gospel principle, whether the day of the Lord is great or terrible, is completely up to us and our choices. As it was in Amos's day. Amos 5, 21 through 27, another plea for justice. Amos turns again to denounce the false and hypocritical displays of religious fervor on the part of his people. Of what avail would feast, solemn assemblies, burnt and meal offerings be in the worship of a righteous God when their hearts and minds were evil and their actions toward their less fortunate brethren were unjust? All of this outward display was unveiling, and Amos cries out for justice in two lines that have become famous. What good is all of your outward forms of worship? If your hearts have not been changed and have come unto Christ. And so two lines. But let justice well up as waters and righteousness as a perennial stream. Justice will only come, brothers and sisters, when we are righteous. We will only treat our brothers and sisters as they should be treated when we are righteous. This clarion call to repentance is one of the finest of all times. Gospel principle, a just society can only be built upon the truth of the gospel. All this social justice crap is a satanic substitute. Justice for all will only be brought about through the righteousness, and that can only be brought about through the covenants and ordinances of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Amos 7 through 9, the visions of Amos. The last three chapters of Amos deal with five visions Amos had. The first four of these visions begin with a phrase such as, the Lord hath, Thus hath the Lord God shown me. The fifth commences with the words, I saw the Lord. The, fourth, the first four visions show the various judgments of the Lord upon Israel, while the fifth vision pretends portends the overthrow of their apostate theocracy and the restoration of fallen Israel. The visions are one, a swarm of locusts, two, devouring fire, three, the master builder with the plumb line, four, the basket of summer fruit, five, the smitten sanctuary. Each has a symbolic meaning that clearly shows that the Lord intended to bring the kingdom of Israel to an end if the people did not repent. The meaning of each vision will be considered individually. A swarm of locusts, Amos 7, 1 through 3. The king who has had the early grass mown is Jehovah. The mowing of the grass denotes the judgments which Jehovah has already executed upon Israel. The growing 
of the second crop is a figurative representation of the prosperity which flourishes again after those judgments. In actual fact, therefore, it denotes the time when the, the dawn had risen again for Israel. That's from Kyle and Dillich, two great Old Testament scholars. So Israel would be mown down, but in the latter days it would once again rise. Devouring fire, Amos 7, 4 through 6. The fire that devoured the great deep, presumably the ocean, is symbolic of the partially destructive wars that Israel was later involved in. Like the fire which did eat up a part of the great deep, Israel land was partly despoiled and many of its people led away. The master builder with the plumb line, Amos 7, 7 through 9. A plumb line is used to obtain exactness and accuracy in construction work. Here it is, seems to symbolize that God's strict justice will prevail in judging Israel for her evil ways. All wickedness will be sought out, measured, meaning judged, and destroyed. This basket of summer fruit, Amos 8, 1-9. through 9. The harvest of summer fruit symbolized the ripening of Israel. Just as summer fruit must be eaten when picked or it will spoil, Israel is ripe for picking and spoiling by enemies. The sun going down at noon, Amos 8, 9 through 14. A man's sun can be said to set at noon if he is taken by death during the prime of his life. A nation's sun figuratively sets at noon when the country is destroyed in the midst of prosperity. But Amos' dual prophecy is also a reminder that before the second coming of the Lord, the sun will be dark and refuse to give her light. Indeed, it will be a sign for the wicked of the last, latter days that the sun is about to set at noon. The smitten sanctuary, Amos 9, 1 through 6. From his dwelling place, the Lord will smite the wicked. There is none to escape. Hide where they may. Only the second coming of the Lord fulfills such a description. For when the Lord comes in his glory, the rewards of justice will be met. No mountain is high enough, no sea so deep, that the unrepentant sinner can hide from the judgment of a just God. So that's the meaning behind the different visions that he had. Amos 8, 11 through 12, a famine in the land. Here again, one finds a clear case of prophetic dualism. Amos predicted a famine of the word of the Lord, which famine certainly occurred during the period of apostasy in Israel and Judah. That's one reason Amos is going to them. They haven't had the word. The hardness of their hearts reached such a state that from 400 B.C. until the ministry of John the Baptist, which began in A.D. 30, as far as we know, there was no prophet in Israel. That is a famine of the word. But Amos' prophecy was also fulfilled at a later time. After Christ reestablished his church on earth, it too evidently fell into apostasy. Again, revelation ceased, and there was a great famine of the word of God, this famine lasting well over a thousand years. President Spencer Duff, W. Kimball, after quoting Amos 8, 11 through 12, said of this famine, Many centuries passed, and that day came when a blanket of disbelief covered this earth. Not a blanket of cotton or wool, but a blanket of apostasy, and a hunger and a thirst by many, which was not satisfied. It was the Lord our God who came to the earth and manifested himself and brought truth again to the earth with prophecy, revelation, authority, priesthood, organization, and all of the benefits of mankind. It was the Lord our God who did all this for us. Elder Joseph B. Wordland said, who at the time was executive area administrator for one of the European areas, spoke of the effect this famine had, had upon Europe. We have observed a restless spirit of searching today among the people of Europe. Why? Because there is a gnawing hunger in the human heart that, if not fed by the truths of the gospel, leaves life empty and devoid of peace. The hodgepodge of economicisms advocated by so-called wise men of the world have solved few, if any, problems and has brought no real joy. Such empty nostrums have left mankind to seek worldly goods and symbols of material power. Bill blinding humanity to the truth that only the righteous life firmly establishes in the daily living of God's commandments brings true happiness. Anything less leaves the heart 
unfed with a yearning inner hunger, a hunger which is in our mission to identify and define of which we should make the people aware. I have seen in Europe the fulfillment of the word of Amos, that there would be a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, but of hearing the word of the Lord. With the restoration of the gospel, a famine came to an end, not for every individual at once, but for the earth in general, as Spencer W. Kimball said. After centuries of spiritual darkness, we solemnly announced to all the world that the spiritual famine is ended, the spiritual drought is spent, the word of the Lord in its purity and totalness is available to all men. One needs not wander from sea to sea, nor from north to east, seeking the true gospel, as Amos predicted, for the everlasting truth is available. Well, Amos 9, 7-15, I will sift the house of Israel among all nations. Amos told Israel they could not expect deliverance simply because they were the chosen people. See Amos 9, 7. The kingdom of Israel, he said, would be destroyed, except for a remnant of Jacob whom the Lord would preserve because of his mercy. See verse 8. The gathering of the righteous remnant will be such that not one worthy soul will be unnoticed, verse 9, and the Lord will establish his work even to the raising of the temple in Jerusalem to its proper place, see verse 11. So Amos sees that a remnant would be left and spared, and in the latter days it would be gathered into Israel once again, and a temple would one day gain its place in Jerusalem before the second coming of the Savior. Every righteous soul who has taken upon himself the name of the Lord, be he Israelite or Gentile, will be brought into the kingdom, Amos 9.12, and the lands of the earth will shed forth their riches. The promises to scatter Israel are secure, for they will be gathered back into the kingdom of God, inheriting every blessing promise to the righteous with no fear of losing them evermore. That's verses 14 through 15. And so we're living in that day, seeing the fulfillment of these prophecies of this great prophet Amos. Gospel principle, Israel will be redeemed and Zion will be established. Well, let's take a look really quick at the one chapter in the book of Obadiah. Who was Obadiah? Obadiah was a seer who was privileged to see in vision the salvation of Israel and other important events of the latter days. His book is the shortest of those of the prophets, indeed of all the books of the Old Testament. Nothing more is known about him than what is in the book. A man named Obadiah protected the Lord's prophet during Ahab's reign, but it is not likely he was the author of this book. The book of Obadiah is included with Jeremiah's writings because he prophesied of the destruction of Edom in similar ways to Jeremiah. Obadiah 1.1, 1, 1, what, what and where was Edom? Edom is another name for Esau, Jacob's brother. The Greek form of the word Edom is Edomia. Those who settled in Edom were close kin to the residents of Judah. Sidney B. Sperry said, The history of the relations between Israel and Edom is from the beginning fraught with envy and hate. In Genesis 36, 1, we have the following statement. Now these are the generations of Esau, the same as Edom. This recalls to us the struggle for supremacy from birth, or even before, of Esau and his younger brother Jacob, who later becomes Israel. Esau sold his birthright to his brother for a mess of pottage, and finally the holy patriarchal inheritance also. Esau, it will be recalled, married among the Canaanites, which fact was a great trial to his parents. Because of their wickedness and lasting hatred for Israel, Edom, like Babylon, became a symbol of the world. You can see that in Doctrine and Covenants 1, section 1, verse 36. Obadiah 1, 3 through 9, Edomites lived in false security. The world-famous ruins of Petra in modern Jordan are remarkable. A whole city was carved out of rock cliffs. It could be entered only through a narrow gorge. From the high cliffs, the Edomites could protect themselves from invading enemies with great success. Petra, or Mount Seir, was in the land of Edom. Many scholars think it was the capital of Edomia. Though many of the ruins now visible at Petra date from a later period, they still give dramatic impact to Obadiah's words. 
Odoniah 1, 10 through 15, the reason for Edom's mighty fall. These verses summarize the reason for Edom's mighty fall, the violence shown against their brother Jacob and the rejoicing at the destruction of the children of Judah in the days of distress. See verse 12. J.R. Dumlow believed that Edom's destruction was partly due to their assisting Nebuchadnezzar during his siege and capture of Jerusalem. So great hatred and violence between Edom and, and Judah. Obadiah 1, 16-21, a day of deliverance and rejoicing. These verses have both a temporal and a spiritual meaning for Latter-day Saints. If Esau, Edom, represents the worldly wicked, these verses may be seen as referring to the day when Israel will be completely restored and evil eliminated. Mount Zion, a symbol for deliverance and holiness, see verse 17, will be the inheritance of the house of Jacob, whereas the house of Esau will be stubble fit only to be burned. The house of Jacob will be a fire and the house of Joseph a flame, and they shall kindle in them Esau and devour them, and they shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau. Verse 18. Eventually, saviors shall come upon Mount Zion to, to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Verse 21. So this is where the famous line comes of saviors upon Mount Zion. Saviors upon Mount Zion. In yet another example of prophetic dualism, Obadiah prophesies of the destruction of Edom or Edomia and the restoration of Israel referred also to the last days. Elder Theodore M. Burton spoke of the role we ourselves play as saviors on Mount Zion. He said, as revealed by the, the scriptures, one of the characteristics of these last days is the appearance of saviors on the earth. This was prophesied in the Old Testament, Obadiah 121. It was prophesied by Paul in the New Testament times, referring to people who had lived on the earth in times of old, Hebrews 11, 39 through 40. It has also been prophesied for us who live today, Doctrine and Covenants 86, 11. So the Lord himself has placed his seal of approval upon this work. A logical question then follows, for whom Am I to be a savior? In section 127 of the Doctrine and Covenants, verse 6, the Lord, the prophet Joseph Smith used these words, For your dead. Our dead, then, are clearly our own progenitors or direct ancestors, as Joseph Smith explained. But how are they to become saviors on Mount Zion? By building their temples, erecting their baptismal fonts, and going forth and receiving all the ordinances, baptism, confirmations, washings, anointings, ordinances, and sealing powers upon their heads, in behalf of all their progenitors who are dead, and redeem them that they may come forth in the first resurrection, and be exalted to thrones of glory with them. And herein is the chain that binds the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the children to the fathers, which fulfills the mission of Elijah." So we become Savior. We become like Jesus Christ. He did a vicarious work for us, a work that we could not do for ourselves by, be, by suffering, dying, and being resurrected. We do a work for those who cannot do it for themselves by doing ordinance work in the temple for our kindred dead. Gospel Principle. Through a vicarious work for the dead, we become like the Savior in a small way. Well, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this presentation on Amos and Obadiah, hit the like button and please subscribe to the channel.